Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope everyone's doing well. If you're visiting with us today, we're encouraged by your presence and we invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street anytime that you may have the opportunity to do so. Anytime that we have visitors with us, you're always considered to be our honored guest and we're thankful that you've come our way. You know, many times we find ourselves asking the question, why do we here at Pyburn Street not do certain things that we see other churches doing? And certainly there are numerous differences that span from what are seemingly small, insignificant things to some very large, significant things that exist between churches. We see differences in how the church treasury is to be used. We're beginning to see some differences in regard to salvation and when one obtains salvation. We're beginning to see more and more congregations of the Lord's church who are beginning to use instruments of music in their worship services. We see differences over whether we should endorse and support social activities and institutions such as children's homes and nursing homes, daycares, schools, things of that nature. We see differences over the number of loaves and the number of cups that should be used in the Lord's Supper. We see congregations that have separate assemblies for children Congregations utilizing praise teams rather than a song leader. And we see more and more congregations that are beginning to expand the role of women. More and more congregations of the Lord's Church are, are allowing women to take a more active role in leadership and the worship services. And some have even begun to appoint female elders and deacons. And some have even begun to have female preachers. But the question that we have to ascertain before we consider any of these things is what is acceptable to God? What is it that God has authorized us to do? But oftentimes in trying to ascertain what the right question is, so often we begin by asking the wrong questions. So many times we think, well, do you really think God cares? Do you really think that this is something significant enough that God is going to hold this against us if we do this? Well, this is a common indicator that many people often use when they try to determine whether they should begin a certain work or a certain practice. Many times they look at a certain situation and they say, well, this, this seems insignificant. I really don't think that, that God would have a problem with this. Well, let's look at an example of some people who may have had this same type of mentality. If we look at Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 3, we're introduced to two young men who were priests. In fact, they were the sons of of Aaron. Their names were Nadab and Abihu. And they were charged with offering sacrifices on behalf of the people. But they were charged to get the fire for the sacrifices only from a specific altar. But I want you to notice what happened when they decided that they were going to go against what God had authorized. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers and put fire in them and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy in the sight of all the people. I will be honored. And Aaron could not respond because he knew that what was stated was the truth and he knew that what his sons had done was unauthorized. So the text says Aaron remained silent. 
But you know, whenever we look at this, we may wonder, well, what was the big deal? Did what these men do really merit them losing their lives? Well, they used an unauthorized, unholy, or profane fire, something that God had not required of them. So surely this is a scene where they may have looked at the situation and thought, well, does it really matter? Do you really think God would care where we get this fire from? After all, fire is fire. So why would it matter? Well, what we do know was that this fire that they offered came from a source that God had not authorized. They did something that God had not permitted them to do. And as a result of this, they lost their life. But so often, we find ourselves thinking and saying, well, I really don't think God cares. You know, fire is fire. I really don't think God is going to care. But yes, God cares. And he proved that to us in this example of Nadab and Abihu. He proved that he will not accept anything that he has not authorized. But whenever we find ourselves putting ourselves in the position of God, because ultimately that's what we're doing when we say, I don't think God would care. We're trying to put ourselves into the mind of God. And folks, when we do that, then we find ourselves worshiping God based upon our own wisdom rather than upon God's wisdom. We're doing what we think is appropriate rather than what God has approved. But then secondly, sometimes we find ourselves asking the question, well, why is this not okay? So-and-so said it's okay. You know, so many times we hear people say, well, my preacher said that it's okay. Or some Bible scholar said that it's okay. Or this is what my family has done for generations, therefore it must be okay. Well... Let's turn and let's look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And I want you to see what Jesus says about this matter of where authority can be found. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority. Notice not just partial authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, did Jesus say that the preacher has been given all authority? No. No. Did Jesus say that our friends have been given all authority? No. Did Jesus say that Bible scholars have been given all authority? No. Did Jesus say that our family has been given all authority? No. He says all authority has been given to me. Therefore, we are to do what Jesus has said that we are to do. All authority comes from God and no one else. And so we are asking the wrong question. If we're looking at this and saying, is this okay because brother so-and-so said it's okay? No. Brother so-and-so is human. Authority has not been given to him. The authority rests with Christ. But then another one that we hear so often today. But it's a good work. If it's a good work, can it really be wrong? Well, this is a common reason that we hear so many people saying today, well, it seems like such a good thing. Like it's accomplishing something that is beneficial. Well, but is this really the right question to ask? Is it a good work? Is it a good deed? Well... If so, does that make it okay? Well, let me give you an example. If we look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 3 through 7, we find that the Ark of the Covenant has been in the home of Abinadab. 
David goes out and he tries to retrieve the ark. And as the ark is brought out of the home of Abinadab, his two sons, Uzzah and Ahio, have the, car, have the ark on a cart and they are driving the cart along. Well, as we see in the text, it says that David and all of the house of Israel, they're going ahead of the ark, they're playing instruments and they're praising God and they're dancing. Well, as they go along, the road got rough. The oxen stumbled. The cart began to shake. And it appeared that the ark was going to fall from the cart. Well, Uzzah saw that a disaster was about to happen. He reached out his hand to steady the ark. Now, looking at this from human reasoning, was that a good deed? Sure it was. He was trying to avoid a disaster. But notice what the text says. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. Well, initially David didn't understand why this had taken place. He took the ark and he placed it into the home of Obed-Edom, and he went back to Jerusalem. He didn't want anything to do with the ark after that. In fact, he was angry with God. He said that he had struck down Uzzah for doing a good work. Well, when he went back to Jerusalem and he began to seek counsel from the religious leaders, they called to his reminder that the ark was not to be touched. In fact, the only ones that were allowed to even move the ark were those who were from the family of Kohath. And they were to move the ark in with wooden staves. They weren't to touch the ark itself. They weren't to place it on a cart. There was a certain way that it had to be done. Oh, but Josh Uzzah had such good intentions. His heart was right. His heart was pure. He was just doing something that was good. No. That may have been what he thought. That may have been what he felt was right. But it was not a good deed. It was not okay with God because it went against what he had authorized. And as a result, Uzzah lost his life. So we see simply looking at something and asking, well, is this a good deed? Is it going to accomplish something good? That's not always the right answer to ask. Well, then we have another. How many times have we heard someone say, well, we've always done it this way? That's what we've always believed. That's the way it's always been done, and we're not going to change. Is the question that we need to ask, is this how it's always been done? Is that what the question should be? Well, the opposite of that is we're not going to do it because we've never done it before. So often, just because we've done something a certain way for the last month, week, year, decade, century, we think that that gives us authority to continue doing it in that certain way. But folks, if you've been doing something wrong for the last month, year, decade, century, it doesn't make it right. Think about all the new things that the first century Christians had to do. You know, it seems like with so many in the Lord's church today that the word new is a dirty word. Anytime something that is new, something that is fresh, something that is different from the traditions that we've always done, we automatically strike it down as something that's wrong. Well, folks, just because it's something that we have never done does not mean that we don't have authority to do it. Once again, think back to the first century for just a moment. They were leaving Judaism behind with all the rituals, all the traditions, all of the things that were expected of them under that system. They were leaving all of that behind. And they were being taught this groundbreaking idea 
that we have to now accept everybody? Remember the Jews had been taught that you are only to consider fellow Jews as your brethren. You are only to feel an obligation toward fellow Jews. But now they're being told, no, the Gentiles can come in and they're going to be your brethren as well. We have to treat everybody equally. Because that was something new, something that they had never done before. Did that make it wrong? No. No not treating people equally was what was wrong. Think about the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. The Jews, they were used to their feast days and things of that nature, but they did not have any type of regulation that stated that they were to come together on the first day of the week to break bread. They did not have any type of weekly observance of any type of feast whatsoever. But yet they were being told that now, rather than go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, you are to come together upon the first day of the week to break bread. Folks, that was something new. Because it was new, did it make it wrong? No. Because God had authorized them to do this. Now, I know that there are differing ideas, differing opinions on this concept, but what I hope that we can at least all agree upon in this matter is that simply doing something different doesn't automatically make it wrong. Simply doing something new does not automatically make it wrong. Because if we think about it this way, everything that is now old, one day was new. So what's the right question? We've looked at some wrong questions to ask, some wrong ideas to think. What is the right question? Well, turn to Mark 11 and verse 28. Those of you that were in our Bible class here in the auditorium this morning, we talked about this story, but we did not talk about it from this uh, standpoint, this viewpoint that we're looking at this morning. Here we find the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders have come to Jesus. Remember, Jesus has been in Jerusalem for a couple of days at this, at this time. He's been going into the temple. He's been preaching. And these religious leaders, they're doing everything in their power to try to find some way to discredit him. Now, up to this point, they've not taken action. Because he has not said anything that they can use against him. But also they were afraid of what the people might do because Jesus was drawing quite a following. Well now they've come up with something. They think we've finally got something that we can get Jesus with. And so they come to Jesus. And they ask him a question. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Now I asked this in class this morning. I'm going to ask it again right now. Was that a good question? Absolutely. That's the question that we need to be asking ourselves all the time. By what authority are we doing these things? Well, Jesus turns it back to them. He says, well, I'm not going to answer you straight out. He said, but I'm going to ask you a question, and you can answer it. He says, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from man? Well, the Jewish leaders, they began to talk among themselves. They thought, oh, he's got us. We thought we had him. No, he has us. Because they knew on one hand... If they said, well, the baptism of John is from heaven, then Jesus would say, then why did you reject John? But on the other hand, if they said it was from man, they knew that the crowd there would revolt because most of them believed that John was a prophet, that he had truly come with the authority of God. Well, they answered Jesus in the way that most people would today. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Well, sure they did, but they weren't willing to answer the question. So they took a cop out. They said, I don't know. 
And Jesus said, well, I'm not going to answer your question. Will you stop and you think about this for just a moment? The reason that Jesus was not going to answer their question was because the answer was going to be the same as the question that he had asked them. The baptism of John was from heaven. It came with the authority of God. The authority of Jesus came from heaven. So if they were going to reject John, then they were going to reject the authority of Christ as well. But they did ask the right question. By what authority are you doing these things? You know, we learn a lot from what Jesus did not say in this text. Notice he didn't turn to the Pharisees and say, I don't need authority for what I'm doing. But sadly, we see many people in the name of religion doing the same thing today. I don't, I don't need God's authority. I think this is right. I think it's what feels good. I think God will approve. Notice Jesus didn't turn to them and try to, to downplay the importance. He didn't say, you don't need authority. You don't need anybody's authority for what you do. Jesus' response was to try to open their eyes to the fact that his authority was coming from God. That they needed to listen to what he had to say. but they weren't willing to open their eyes and open their hearts to the reality of what was going on around them. They had a very narrow view of authority, and they thought it rested with them and with their traditions. They didn't think that it would rest with Christ. They understood that this was the question they needed to ask, but they weren't asking it out of a genuine desire to know the truth. All of our practices, all that we do in our service and our worship to God, we have to have authority for it. That authority must come from God Himself. We looked at the example of Nadab and Abihu, they missed that. We looked at the example of Uzzah, he missed that. They didn't look for what God had asked them to do. But this is the question that we have to ask. And as we've already determined, we often ask the wrong question. But when it comes to things that we are doing in the name of the Lord, in worship, in our service to Him, so often we want to stop and we want to ask, well, how do I feel about this? Or better yet, how does this make me feel? Or we want to rely upon what someone else has said or upon a, a time-honored tradition. We want to say this is a good work. It can't be wrong. Or we want to look at this and, and take the arrogant position. Well, God doesn't care. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? To put yourself in such a position as to truly say, I don't think God cares. Folks, we cannot look into the mind of God. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But yet this is what so many times people are saying. So what are some of the problems that we see from not asking this question? Oh, there are so many. Folks, we see differences. We see divisions. We see splits. This is one of the reasons why we see so many different groups in the world around us today claiming to be churches. People are not asking the right question. And by not asking the right question, we face religious division. And again, it's not is this something that's going to accomplish a good work. It's not, is this something that I like, something that I approve of? But the question is, do we have authority from God? 
Do we have His permission for the things that we're doing? Yes, we've seen divisions over whether instruments of music and worship is acceptable. Folks, the question is not, does it sound good? The question is not, do you think God really cares? The question is not, well, what have people done in the past? The question is, do we have God's approval? Do we have His authority to do it? Folks, we do not find that authority given to us in His Word. Therefore, it's something that we should not do. Some will teach that we're saved at the point of belief. Well, the question is not what others have said about it. It's not what scholarly books or commentators or preachers say about it. Do we have the authority of God? No, we don't. Because by the authority of God, we're told that salvation comes at the point of obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ that takes place in the waters of baptism because in Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's authority. Oh, don't you see the danger in ignoring this? You see, we're standing on very dangerous ground if we're doing something that God has not authorized. In Mark 7, verses 6 through 9, Jesus said unto them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. When we do not look to the authority of God, then what we are doing is vain. It's not accepted by God. And with a heart that is far from God, we will be lost. Even if we think it's right, even if we think God won't care, we will be lost. In fact, Jesus says that we are rejecting the commandment of God. The dangers are clear. We will be led into error if we stop asking the right question. This one question settles it all, does it not? By what authority do you do these things? Well, folks, there's several other things that we could talk about in this subject. But our time is about gone. The thing that we need to remember... Whenever we come together in this assembly, we have come together for a purpose. And that is to worship and honor God. To do His will. Not to do what is pleasing to our senses. Not to do what we think is right or what we think God might accept. But to do what He has told us He expects. And the same thing goes when we become a child of God. When we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus said we are to be taught to observe all things that He has commanded us. We are to base our lives upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not upon our desires, not upon our traditions, not upon what brother so-and-so says, but upon what Jesus Christ has said. We find that authority from God's Word. And anything that we believe or that we are practicing either in our daily lives as a Christian or in our worship to God, if we cannot go to His Word and find authority for that, we must reject it. One question settles it all. 
By what authority are we doing these things? This morning, I want you to ask yourself another question as we bring this lesson to a close. Have I been seeking God's authority for what I do? Have I been living my life according to what is taught in God's Word? Or have I been seeking my own interpretations, my own ideas, my own desires, putting my own spin on God's Word? Well, please understand today that you cannot do that. We see elderships in the Lord's Church today that are leading literally thousands of people down the road to destruction because they have allowed unauthorized practices to come into the worship assemblies. They have allowed teachers to get into the pulpit and proclaim things that are false doctrine. And I thank God every day that we have elders that seek to stand up for the truth. That we have a sound congregation of the Lord's people here at Pyburn Street. But it's always possible that there is someone here that you have been allowing yourself to be led astray in some way. Following after your fleshly desires, listening to someone else that is teaching you another gospel. Remember, the Bible says that if someone comes to you teaching another gospel other than what you have been taught, they're to be accursed, rejected. But consider yourself this morning. If you're not living a faithful Christian life, let's make some changes. Let's get right with God today. If there's sin that's in your life that's pulled you away from God, repent of those things. Come forward. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf and let us encourage you as you strive to get your life right. Or if there's someone here this morning who has never obeyed the gospel, then we would encourage you this morning that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins today. Come forward. Confess that you believe that He is the Son of God and be baptized have your sins washed away. The Lord will add you to the church. My desire today is for each and every person that is in this assembly to be able to leave here today knowing that we're in a right relationship with God. And so this morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.